It's always fascinating listening to watch owners, hearing their opinions, understanding their principles and their perspectives around the watches that they collect. Through the process, we learn a little bit more about them. We try and get into their heads a bit more and, along the way, can sometimes learn more about ourselves and our preferences. Thanks to some of your suggestions, and since it's the end of the year, I thought it would be a great time to discuss the state of the collection. A very small watch collection, to say the least, but at least you will be able to see a little bit more about me and about the watches that I prefer to own. All the pieces you will be seeing are a part of a weekly rotation. So most of these watches I wear virtually every other day. But let's get into it. First thing I will say is that I am wearing a Casio. I've been bitten by the bug. And I really look forward to running a series next year. Basically how a novice approaches Casio watches and what I've learned through this short experience with them. Everything from the utilitarian F91W all the way to the G-Shock and beyond. So the watch I'm wearing that I've really been enjoying is the Casio World Timer, or the Royale, I think it's called, as a part of its name. And it's amazing, truly is amazing. One of the most affordable world timers you can get on the market. And I've just learned so much about how intuitive their designs are. And that's something I want to try and bring across when I do these reviews. First watch in the rotation is the Smith's Everest. This is the gilt dial model. I've championed this watch for a very long time. I think at least a year or two years ago, I did a video all about how this was my favorite everyday watch, and it still meets that mark. Yes, it is an homage of a Rolex 1016 Explorer, but look at how much a gilt dial Explorer costs today. It gives you a bit of a reality check when you see a watch go for between 20 and 30,000 pounds, if it's in great condition. This watch has all the qualities I greatly appreciate about vintage styling, and it's one of the most recognizable Explorer designs, which I really like. The fact that not only Rolexes were used during the Hillary expedition, but Smith's watches were supplied too. And it's believed, this is all you know, conjecture, that Smith's was actually the first watch to reach the summit, and not Rolex. That's neither here nor there. So of all the watches, of all the brands that create 1016 homages today, the Smith's name on a dial like this is special because it is a tributary in a way. Going back to what makes the gilt dial so fascinating is that this has been approached the correct way of how a dial should be gilted. The lettering hasn't been painted on like many watches that we see today. Instead, the process is the reverse, where paint has been removed to reveal the brass underneath. That's the true approach of how gilt dials were made back in the day. Since it's also a gloss dial, you get excellent light play. And I fitted it to a custom-made Epsom calf leather strap, bunt strap, a combination that doesn't get much respect today, but I think for a watch of this size, 36 millimeters, brings the size up a little bit on the wrist and also gives you an Explorer feel because I'm sure most of you know the Bunt strap was invented so that the watch wouldn't stick to the skin for pilots who were using them. So this in a way is an old school interpretation of how you would see a 50s, 60s Explorer watch if it was actually being used in colder conditions, which is nice. It's a great little watch. I'll always be fond of it and I think what makes it even better is the fact that it's a vintage inspired watch that can be worn. You know, it's got a sapphire crystal, it's got a screw down crown. It can take a good few knocks and still keep going. Next in the selection is the Seiko 5 SNK 381K1. Just finished a video about this watch and it should be on the channel now. I'll share the link in the corner of the screen, but this watch has made quite an impact on me as a watch owner. As someone who has never fully understood Seiko, what it represents, the Seiko 5 is one of those watches that I truly think a collector should own. It's not just about owning the dive watches and the chronographs, it's about owning the simple things. This is one of the cheapest watches I own in the collection, but it pulls its weight. And I also love the design history and the story behind it. And really, if you know me and you know the watches that I love, as you will see through the collection, they all have a similar styling. The applied Arabic numerals are amazing. It adds so much character, there's great legibility. It's got this old school, new world feel to it as well. I'm going to send it off to have a few modifications made, but great watch, worth every penny. The Oris Divers 65, probably the most fun watch I have in the collection. What I find so fascinating about this timeline of when these watches were produced is that they were so unapologetically strange. They were transitioning away from the hard utilitarian 1950s and then the bizarre funk of the 70s. So in the middle, you have these watches that don't really know what they're doing, but they're definitely experimenting and they're trying new things. So we have the arrangement of skin divers, extremely thin cases, most of them were manually wound. 
with this model crazy Arabic numerals with a reverse arrangement. And what I've learned from this watch, the experience that I've had, especially with the strap that I've paired with it, is that there is a perfect strap for any watch out there. And that in a way is part of the hunt. Once I have the watch, the next phase is looking for the ideal strap that'll go with it. So being 40 millimeters in size, extremely thin case, one of the thinnest automatic watches I've ever handled. The Sapphire Crystal, you would swear is acrylic. The date window is also barely noticeable. Something I really like about a dive watch is when the date window is out of the way. The fact that it integrates so well above the six and that it's almost hidden, it's great. You'll also notice that a lot of the watches I choose have minimal text and font on their dials. This is all just a part of the process. You get so critical at a stage where you start looking to see how many lines of text have been used. It gets quite tough when you're dealing with a short list like this and all the watches have to pass scrutiny of some kind. The Smiths W10. I have had a love affair with these watches over the course of this year. In fact, I've had four Smiths W10s come in and out of the collection. This one is from 1969. And the reason why I love it so much is just purely the condition. The story behind the W10, I've said so many times, I'm sure most of you probably know it, but what makes it even more special is that the entire watch being in-house made, something I haven't emphasized is that the movement made in the UK was actually based on a JLC caliber. The fact that English watchmaking at the time, they used gilding on the entire movement. It's beautiful. It's a real work of art. And I think as far as field watches go, this to me is pretty much the epitome of field watch design. Maybe I'm just biased, but the simplicity, the balance, the fact that this dial in a way calls back to the dirty dozen watches of the 1940s. There's nothing about this watch that screams, look at me, but it's so captivating. And maybe that's why we love the pure utilitarian nature of military watches in themselves. They offer you so much and they ask for so little. This one is beautiful. The condition of the case is so well finished. The dial is immaculate, and I have never seen a triangle at the 12 to be so sharp before. And these were all the things that sold me on the watch. The Seiko Prospects SPB143. This was my first Seiko that I bought about a year ago. And what grabbed me about this piece, obviously the skin diver aesthetics are great, but I really appreciated how the brand reinterpreted their original dive watch, the 62 MAS. I look forward to doing a further review on this model because there is a lot to talk about. But this piece in a way goes after the Tudor Black Bay for a more affordable price. It does offer you a lot of bang for your buck. As far as getting into Seiko as a dive watch category, if you want to move into the Prospects area, this is a great first watch to get. It's always good to judge a dive watch by its pure ruggedness. And I must say that this is the kind of watch that just by handling it, you could take it on any trip, any expedition, and it wouldn't fail on you. And that's always the benefit of a good diver. The movements that are in these watches are bulletproof. And looking between these two skin divers that I've just shown, you can see that I am quite the fan of the NATO strap. And I think they work very well on these two models, both of which are from Gekota, I believe. And there's something so dynamic you can get out of a watch when you pair it with a NATO strap that's also vibrant, that also has character to it. The Longines Big Eye. Something important to mention is that I am not a chronograph person. I have never seen the practicality. I've never found enjoyment with chronographs. But this watch is the best watch purchase I have ever made up until now. Why do I say that? I bought this watch March, April this year, and it's the one watch I have worn the most. I wear it two to three times every single week. And that's mind blowing. This piece has completely shifted the way I interpret the chronograph. Maybe it's in part because it's an automatic chronograph and that I don't have to worry about winding it. Maybe it's just because it has this field watch aesthetic that I love so much. The arrangement of the dial, the handset, the minor character traits of the big eye, the fact that it's much larger on the dial, the legibility. And I think when a watch is so well addressed, when its size and everything has been interpreted properly, the proportions and everything make sense. If we're talking about grab and go watches, this is the one I'll be picking up time and time again. I think there are too many good things I could say about the watch. The wearing experience has been so good. It's so well made, so well put together. There is nothing about it that demands your attention. And what I also find very special about this piece is that you can look at the hands wherever they are placed on the dial and find it aesthetically pleasing. This is something that a lot of watches can't do. They simply can't do because there's too much open space or the hands don't look very good in certain places. And it's made me rethink a lot about where I might go with chronographs in the future. Is something like a Speedmaster now off the table? 
Those kinds of questions, you know, those ones that keep us up at night. Absolutely love the big eye. If I had to sell my entire collection, this one would stay. Now next to the pure practicality, the usability of all the other watches that you've seen in the collection, this one, this one's different. This is an heirloom. This is something that I will keep for the rest of my life because it's a part of me in a way. It's special because it represents a certain time in my life and that it took me three years of hunting for this watch and looking at it virtually every year to finally pull the trigger on it. It was one of those delayed fuses, one of those pieces that I knew was going to be a part of the collection someday. And I was just extremely fortunate to get one. This is the kind of piece that I will wear over a weekend. This is not something that I'll wear every day, but it's the character and the bizarreness of 1950s watch design that always brings me back for more. I guess the designer in me appreciates the simplicity, the bare bones aesthetics and history that all of these watches represent, all the way from the 30s to the 70s and beyond. Also notice, this is something I didn't realize, is that practically all the watches are reissue based. Now does this mean that the modern watches just don't interest me enough? Maybe that's a thing. Maybe there's too much sterility with modern watch design and I appreciate the older approaches, when there was more competition, when brands were more daring. And as a bit of a bonus round, talking about watches that I would love to add to the collection, of course, my attention is on Rolex. It would be great to add a Rolex one day. A Tudor is also something on the cards. And you know, Cartier is a piece I would love to add. A Santos on a bracelet, that would be so good. So I hope you've enjoyed the long talk about the watches in my collection. It's a simple collection. But I think very much like me, I prefer watches that don't attract attention and are ones that have some design significance that maybe not everyone appreciates. But that is the beauty of this hobby. That was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I should also add that if you can't see me in this video, it's because the lighting's changed. I'm sure most of you have seen that now. It's because the fluorescence that I normally use above me they don't have a dimmer switch, so normally when I'm recording, I'm squinting at the camera lens. It throws off concentration like mad. So I've got a standing light on the left-hand side. I'm so new to all of this stuff, to lighting and camera work and everything, so it, it might not be very good. I'll do some editing and hopefully get the lighting okay. But this made recording so much easier today, and I hope, hope it's a little bit better. I hope it's improved a bit. Final thing I will say to anyone who's new who's never experienced watch collecting before, if this is the first time, is that this is not a rush, this is not a race. Appreciate the smaller collections and find pieces that you truly enjoy. I really hope you all have a great Christmas and New Year, that you look after yourselves. If you're watching this in like March 2022, ignore this. You can close the video off now. I'm just saying my farewells.